Um, have you got anything you'd like to tell us today? Um, did you say farming in? Oh. Yeah, yeah, farming in prehistory. Yeah. Oh. No, I, I, I don't know what's happened this week, really. Oh, I've just seen. Um, there was I something lost... on the telly about uh, the hospitalaries. Hos hospitalaries. 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 Right. <laughs> right. Anyway, and 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 unless it's about archaeology, we'll move on. <laughs> right. Um. Pat, anything well, well, from you? No, I mean the only thing I can say is that you know we. will oh, say um, it quick. St John's house. Yeah, go on. I, I, they thought it was a hus hospitalary, St John's hospitalary. Yeah, but I don't think they've got any actual medieval artifacts or well, evidence to say that it is. That yeah, okay, no. that that's good. That's good. Anyway, and keep watching that one, and we'll carry on. Anything from All you, right. Pat? Well, I just saw a brief note on my Google. It said um, those. Stones didn't come from Wales. There's evidence they're researching it didn't come from Wales. <laughs> oh my God! I God know. Right on the top. <laughs> oh, and is it cold in there? I can see your breath. What's happening? <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. It, well, the thing is, I, it doesn't. I, I've been I've been working outside all day. I, I've been I, I've been working working with the lambs. I've been. Working, I've, I've been working on our quarry because we've actually got a quarry here. Um, and uh, yes, I, I, I all, all sorts of different things. I've, I've been obviously working on the live show stuff, taught the class this morning. Um, <laughs> they didn't heat the tent or the roundhouse, huh? Well, uh, the thing is, I, I don't feel cold, it, oh, it, it, yeah, I, I don't know. Um, yeah, so uh, base, basically, um, on on um. I, I'm interested about that news on on the stones, so I'm gonna have to type that. I'm gonna have to write that down. Yeah. So, so there's the the blue stones is likely um, to have come from outer space by the stones. Right? So I'll, um... <laughs> I don't know what the research was. I thought what? That's the only okay. Well, we, we we will do that next week. Now I've been tipped off. Henry, um, Henry, Henry sent me a message. He said, um, "Remember, I will not be with you tonight." He said to give his love to Goff. Um, he said human remains found at the new prison sewer site, which dates back to 4,500 years um, in East Yorkshire. So I, I don't have any more than that. Right. So anything else, Pat? Nope, that's it. Right. OK. Right. Next. Peter, um, how how are you with your old doings? Yeah, yeah. All good. All good. Um, I, I don't know if it's. It's it's been in the news, but I don't know. I'm I'm sure they're like year old finds and things. But Must Farm seems to have cropped up in the news. Um, yeah. yeah. And uh, there's been some lovely things like that hafted axe that was like almost completely intact and yeah, incredible preservation. But yeah, I don't well, I don't know. If, is it just because a report's been released or something? But I'm not sure. Yeah, I, but... I, I, actually, strangely enough, I got it in my diary, Cambridge University. Musk volume one and two. So, um, yeah, the, the, the volumes one and two are out. Um, whether I'm going to afford the um, I don't know, the, the 200 quid to buy them, I don't know, but um, uh, um, it seems it seems a lot of money for one lecture. So, what, I, what I'm going to try and do is, is get as much stuff as I can together for the Musk Farm lecture. And it's quite interesting that we that we waited to do the Musk Farm lecture and now we've got the results. So, um, Mm. that's that's going to be i might do it over two lessons i don't know because there's a quite a lot of material there yeah it sounds like there's they've got loads amazing stuff you know it's a it's a, it's a whole settlement at the end of the day yeah. so um it, it's it, it's it's fascinating stuff so yeah that that's really relevant and we will be doing that in the near future um i'm not it won't be next week i've, I've got to try and get this no, stuff. no fair enough uh, no got, great got, i look forward to that we'll be doing flag fen next week actually oh yeah great um, and um and that will be flag fen part two and there'll be yeah. loads of images that you haven't seen and um it's like today all the stuff that you'd be seeing today you're not going to get on the internet like like mm. i did this morning so um cool. um we're going to try and get more e exclusive stuff 
Uh, right. OK, then. Um, anything from uh, Richard, my my dear? Oh, anything else from you, Peter, before we crack No, no, on? no, that's everything. That's great. Thank you. OK, my, my pleasure. Oh, apparently Adam's moving to Wales, so that'll be good. Oh, yeah, nice one. What did you say? Adam's moving to Wales. Um, he's he's going. He's living. He's moving to Brackler around, so you'll be able to see him on a regular basis. <laughs> uh, right. Okay. Uh, Richard, anything from you? Uh, nothing. <laughs> nothing from me. And 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 Anne, we don't talk about the things that we talked about this morning at the end of the lecture. Okay. Oh, I've forgotten already. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that, that's that's good, really, because it, it's rather embarrassing. Right. Oh, OK, then. Um, what about you, um, Goff? Anything from you? No, no. But I was pleased that you uh, you enjoyed that little video I sent you of uh, Maddie Clude. Oh, oh yeah. I, I um, actually, um, Peter wanted to ask you something. On that, oh, on yeah. That go on, go on, Peter. Well, what, how, with, uh, blah, 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 blah. I only live a few miles from Oakhampton. Yeah, it's in, uh, it was in South Zeal. Oh, which, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is near South Torton. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, I know what you mean. The Seas, the pub is called. There's only two pubs there. There's only a tiny place. Yeah. And they do that performance every new year. It's really, really strange and fantastic. And, uh, yeah. So it's a great get, atmosphere. Well, we, we just happened to be walking through and saw everybody and these dancers outside. And then we went in, there was this performance of uh, with the Maddie Third and uh, all different sorts of other characters and nobody knew they, why they were there. You know, it was it was, uh, it was really good. Yeah. Yeah. I think Carl, I think Carl liked it. Because <laughs> he's into horses. Yeah, I, 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 basic, basically, um basically from for my live show the tickets are now on on sale for us for gun lice for next year chaps will right. be sorted out soon um and, 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 and but what we're gonna do we're trying to find a um a horse's skull to have our own married Floyd as part of the performance in Astrid gun lice because Astrid gun lice they still have a married Floyd as as a married Floyd is 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 yeah. a tradition that, that has, has has been revived, so uh, there yeah. have been two offers of people wanted to make Pape and Mache ones for us, which would be equally good. Um, but yeah, um, John Exton, John 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 Exton, yeah, he came. Right. He's involved with the Mary Lloyd in Astridgunness. He was at the one in the church. Ah, right, yeah, 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 yeah. And he's yeah, got his yeah, own yeah. workshops, you know. But I right. don't know how much it would cost. You go to Chepstow, I know. I, I well, ask bit, him. You ask you ask him, man. Right. You ask him, please. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna get started now. And um I I did I did ask Peter this morning, I said, what did you feel about last last night's class? Because it was a lot of it, there was a lot of sort of focus on um and not very much discussion. Uh, but they liked it. So what I might do is drag one or two of you in and um, to sort of pad it out a little bit. And you, you, you'll you know what I mean when we go through this. But, but what, I, what I wanted to do was that we have mentioned farming. We've mentioned animals. We've mentioned trees. We've mentioned crops. Um, and I just thought maybe as we're now in the Bronze Age and we're slowly eking towards the end of the Bronze Age, I, I thought maybe it might be wise that that I tie some things up <clears throat> information wise, and and of, also we we've got one on mining to another one on mining to come as well, so uh, that that'll tie that one up as well, and um, you know it, it's um, I I've I'm 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 digging out I'm digging out an old quarry actually and uh, we're finding a lot of gravel in it. Um, and the quarry looks like it could be pretty old, and so it, that would be good. Another lecture to do about mining. So, so let's get on to the farming. And but before we go on to farming, before before I complete the report, I just wanted to show you a little artifact that I'm working on, and mm -hmm. uh, it's this artifact here, and it, it's actually Iron Age, and it's a piece of Iron Age pottery. 
that was being eroded into the sea. It's, it's the base of a pot, actually, a base of an Iron Age pot. And it it's from a site which is on the uh, west coast of Shetland um, from a Brock site that was being eroded into the sea. And basically, that's the base. Um, and that's how thin it is, really. And as you can see, it's coming up there. And I just want to show you that, obviously, as pottery evolves as well, that's another thing that we've done, look, been looking at pottery. As pottery evolves from the Neolithic period where, where the walls of pot are rather thick, then you get to the Bronze Age where they're thinner, and then you get to the Iron Age where they're really starting to hone their craft of making pottery. Uh, this is something that I wanted to show you. This is where we're going. And and, and again, when, when we're talking about farming... That's where we're going as well when when we're, we're looking at farming today. So we're just going to leave these up there. You can you can have a quick quick read of this. Um, and this is a lot about evidence and how we we associate evidence with with prehistory and how the evidence seems to come together. And what we did we we did a lot of inferred stuff last night. And hopefully, I I can I can, I can maybe bring that out as well. So the nature of the evidence, the nature of the evidence in prehistory to see farming is not always as obvious. So what I mean by that, if you looked at modern farming, you've got field boundaries. You look at modern farming, you might find animal bones in a field. You might look at modern farming and you might find that there was wheat planted there 10 years ago because there's a little bit of wheat growing on the side of the field. Right. Um but we don't really have all those clues when we look at prehistory. So we've got to go a lot deeper. So in order to reconstruct the remote past, and that's what prehistory is, the further back in time, the more sparser the evidence and the, the harder us forensic archaeologists and archaeologists have to work. We are strictly at the mercy of, 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 of conditions and indicators. The conditions being that we might have peaty landscapes, conditions being that we might have dry landscapes, damp landscapes, boggy landscapes, um, acidic landscapes, alkaline landscapes. And within that, there's there's different preservations of material in regards to pollen grains, these pollen grains in front of us. Carbonized, um, carbonized seeds, such as the ones there, we might actually find through archaeological excavation tools, fragments of tools. We might find as we're, we're excavating um, bones, waterlogged deposits, thinking about Must Farm. We know what we're talking about. Beautiful preservation at Must Farm. Uh, bowls with food still in them being excavated. But Must Farm um, is, is a miracle of Bronze Age preservation 3,000 years ago. But that's not always available. In fact, it's very rare that that evidence is available. So pitifully short sometimes when we look at archaeological sites. However, given this evidence, we, we, we try to put as much together and bring it all together to give weight to the archaeological record of the past. And, and we, we think of the archaeological record as a past being so far distant and something that we don't rightly understand but working on a quarry myself just I'm, I'm digging a hole in the ground to create an underground greenhouse um we're coming across what's there by accident and i'm and i'm starting to think i'm learning lots of things myself anyway so when when we think about pollen grains and we think about these images in front of us what we know over in a a is a pollen grain of a grass. B is a pollen pollen grain of hazel. C is fat hen. D is beech. Elm, E, and oak, the good old um, F. Now, what, what these grains are, are, are <laughs> a part of the evidence that blows through the air. And these grains are specific to the male reproduction productive elements causing the female uh, plants 
to be productive. These grains, these these blow through the air or, or are moved around by insects and other animals. These grains are microscopic, smaller than grains of sand. So, so when we think about these grains, naturally, most of them might end up either being sent into a river and being sent out to sea. These grains might be dispersed in the wind and they might actually hit their targets. Some of these fail to reach their goal and the ones that reach their goal have are lost to the reproductive process. But the ones that have lost their goal, wind dispersed pollen, might form a drift into the muds and the silts of our prehistoric landscape, like mm -hmm. musk farm like the muds there, like Flag Fen that we'll be mm. looking at next week, like Star Car from the Mesolithic period, like the landscape of the, of the Somerset levels. So these pollen grains are small bits of evidence of previous landscapes, of, of lands and worlds and lives that are no longer with us. When we think about these pollen grains ending up in lakes and the bottoms of lakes and rivers, sediment layers beneath the water in peat bogs, marshy landscapes like Must Farm. These are critical factors that indicate offering this, their survival and their recovery as identification of past landscapes. So the conditions for their survival are quite specific, anaerobic and sometimes acidic. Peat bogs are ideal sources, which peat bogs, as we're aware, are acidic. Sometimes peat bogs, bones don't survive, but the flesh does. Mm. Unusual parameters of the past. Peat bogs are ideal sources for pollen evidence because these grains are rigid and specific to their survival in the acidic conditions and sealed and preserved for many generations, for mi millennia after millennia. By extracting these cores, that we see through augering, we auger cores into the bogs and the earth and the lake sediments and analyzing the pollen grains uh, present, it is possible to build up a picture of the plants, particularly including trees, which were in the region of the bog. Further given the ability to date organic material by radiocarbon date and evidence, you can actually get more information by looking at these grains. And, and obviously telling us not only about past landscapes, but also telling us about the date range, which the layers are to be found, that this evidence is to be found in looking at radio, um, car, uh, looking at carbon-14 dating. So generally what we, what we do see ab about the past is that um, plants themselves are, are prolific um, pollen producers, um, and there's a lot of it out there. But obviously you need to have um, the ability to to spot the evidence under the microscope to actually build and to reconstruct past environments. Unfortunately, what we one one thing that uh, we we do find in archaeology is is that um, when when we when we see past landscapes, just because we might find pollen grains of some types of grasses and and, and maybe elm or whatever it doesn't mean to say that other things didn't exist to except certain things don't get preserved lots of things don't get preserved in archaeology usually what i say about a certain layer to do with prehistory say for example we're talking about um 4003 years um ago right we're looking in the bronze age um that specific date might only tell us a certain picture of the past. So whenever you see reconstructions of the past, they're only partial, they're never complete. We don't know much in the way of the people and the sounds and the loves and the lives of the animals and the people that once existed on those landscapes. We could only presume from some of the evidence that humans were there. And very interestingly, when you actually start to see certain types of pollen, so for example, if we look at it this way, say for example, we look at a lower layer, um, we might find elms, we might find we might find the pollen grains of elms, beech, and hazel, and then the layer above it, we might just find evidence of of grasses. So at some at some stage, right, that the the, the grains 
indicative of those layers have changed. And why they've changed is because the hazel, the beech and the elm has disappeared and they've been replaced by grasses in one way, shape or form, sometimes due to human inference, mainly always due to human inference. But as we know, it's not always it's not always the true picture of the past, because there's other things that alter the past, climatic conditions, floods, natural fires. Um, all these other things have impacts on the past. So we can't always blame our human ancestors for, for what we're seeing in these layers. Significant reductions of tree pollens in the sample cores without climate change um, indicators are used as evidence of agriculture. And the delicate um, the decline in abundance, for example, of certain trees might be because the trees have been cleared. However, we know from a few years ago that we had um, we, we had ash die back. We, we had we, many years before that we had we had elm tree. Uh, um, we had we had elm, elm, Dutch elm disease. Um, and sometimes when we look at the past, we can see whole trees disappearing in in the in the pollen record and it doesn't mean to say that humans are, are active in cutting down those trees for example if we might see it's it, it's not happened just once um elm tree pollen in the neolithic is often quoted in in the instance of sometimes it disappears and that might indicate that there was a dutch elm disease present for the decline of those trees in, say, the Neolithic and maybe the Bronze Age, so we we can't we can't always presume and blame human beings for everything. Do you know what? I've, I've obviously I've got to be careful in what I say now because um, YouTube don't like people going off the narrative. It's you know we've we've got to believe that global warming is actually happening. If I say anything different, I could be in deep trouble. But um, but what I can say uh, is that. Um, we can't always blame human beings for what's going on on this planet, right? There are other things going on, right? Like Dutch elm disease, right? So we've got to be be very careful when we when we see well, the decline of why, people. That's why we I want to end quickly. I'm in a flow. That's why we can't have complete control over the na of nature because it's got its own control. You know, it's, oh, it's nature, uh, dire, yeah, nature. Isn't it? Nature has its own control. You are right. And I'm glad you've put that in there. Um, you know, for for example, I, I've got a neighbor uh, that came up to me the other week. He said, um, he said everything that we're saying, everything that we're seeing on the landscape um has been influenced by by human um change. By and I yeah, I, I, I said I say agree with that, right? Um however, um how Mother Nature takes over is what Mother Nature does. Uh, there are bits of the landscape that human beings have not touched, right? Sometimes there are bits of the landscape that human beings haven't touched that that are prone to destruction by other forces. So when we when we think about when we think about agriculture and we think about pollen as evidence, it's use it's very useful to understand the dispersal of trees and glasses and that grasses and then yeah. when we start to see we can actually see that there's a similar thing going on uh with with the pollen evidence uh, with with the with the grains that that we're looking at the pollen grains when we actually look at the cereal crops that human beings have been introducing right so it's the same thing the same evidence that we see and, and, and what we're looking at um it is is also to be found in layers so so say say suddenly we're, we're looking at these layers right um okay um you can imagine um years ago uh we're looking at the the cores and the bottom of the core we actually see evidence of of elm trees we we, we see evidence of hawthorn we we see evidence of midland hawthorn we see, we see evidence um of 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 yew and, and oak and all these other different trees, you know, the, the, up to 36 varieties of British trees. And then suddenly it all goes, right? And, and then we look and we think, right, okay, we've got the pollen grains of just grasses. Well, what, what's, what, and, and that's in the next layer above it. And we're thinking, well, what, what's happened to cause that? And then trees come back again. Oh, okay, Mother Nature's taken over again. So 
So, so why are we? Why did we just have grasses? Is that to do with human beings? Right? Have we find any other evidence now? And then directly above that, we we see what we do see is we see the pollen grains associated with cereals, such as voila, um, such as such as these carbonized carbonized seeds, for example, um, for example, Emma. Um, emma wheat there emma wheat there uh, at the top there um and then what we've got then below we've got spelt now the, these these are actually whole carbonized seeds these these ain't blown around in the wind but you can imagine that the um that that the pollen grains associated with these in that layer the layer above those grasses uh no above uh, because what we yeah we've got the trees we've got the grasses we've got the trees and then directly above the trees we've got the evidence of of of, of total clearance because what we've got is, is in the core whether it's a peat bog or whatever what what we've got is that these these have been introduced right the, these these have been strongly introduced carbonized seeds now it's it's not it, it's it's very rare to have carbonized seeds on archaeological sites but when they do come up they're they're really really useful and when we're doing something called flotation in archaeology when when you when you float the, when you float the earth, when you when you float the sediment, um, in 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 archaeology, um, what 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 you do, you 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 put it um you put a, you put it all in water, right, and then all the all the carbon carbonized stuff floats to the surface. So you swoop that up, you bag it up, and then you then. And um, you then get all that material then and you sift it in different grids and then you find different ev other other evidences as well. Yet that's where you're going to find the um, the pollen grains. Right. So that's called flotation. But when you're, when you're actually specifically looking at um, the excavation of settlements of, of all prehistoric periods, um, thinking and looking for plant seeds that have been turned into charcoal are, are beautiful indicators that human beings have been planting certain crops and improvement in excavation techniques um, allied to careful um, sieving and floating of these deposits has increased um, what we know about the past um, environment um, dramatically. Now, the one the one the one danger in archaeology is is what's going on with the with the Internet at the minute. Um, uh, and it, it's it's sometimes very difficult to to glean what's going on on the internet because um, sometimes people might be um, re republishing stuff from an archaeological excavation fifty years ago where they wouldn't have had this evidence to do with um, you know carbonized seeds and pollen grains and oh we found a bit of pottery we didn't find anything else but if you excavate the same site today you'd find the carbonized seeds you'd find all the other evidence right um, and and. And and you need to get that into real time, into into books and documents. Um, I'm a big fan of books and documents, as you know. Anyway, back to this. So the seeds have been carbonized, and they are largely they largely retain their shape. And even though it's been carbonized, the shape tells you what it is. Right, the grains tell you what they are because of the shape. As you can see, that the carbonized, um, the 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 complete wheat chief there of the emma the top one there um zoom in that 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 and you know it's an echo what they've done they've taken a latex mold of that um and, and that itself um the shape and form of that we know that that's emma um emma wheat um you know i actually i actually had um i made an emma wheat pancake the other day right um it didn't work the same as normal flour yeah. right but but you can still buy emma wheat and it's been something that's been with us for a very long time. The reason why emma wheat is not popular today is it's it's a bit tougher, right? Uh, but you can see there that you can basically pick them off the chief there um, uh, and the chief there, and you can pick them off, right? With barley, you've got many more, and you've got a fresh barley, right? So um, when when you get when you get more grains, big, you know, obviously the um, the seed them, themselves. Um, you know, you, you go for something much more productive like barley um, rather than Emma. 
So, so what what you can see when when you're looking at charcoal as well, other charcoal fragments give other indicators of 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 human agricultural activity. And and one thing that we do see with charcoal is that you can tell what trees are growing around, whether it's aspen indicating that it was a watery landscape, or um, you know some of the, some of the the willows, or, or whether it's a, more of a grounded landscape like oak and um, something like um, hawthorn and so on. So so bits of wood. And bits of that evidence tell you virtually give you an impression of the past. But people in the past were very selective. For example, um, I'll give you give you an idea. Today, I I, um, I, I built a sheep shelter the other day. Well, it, it, um, for the lambs, and and the hurdles in there are all made of pine of varying different disease, uh, di um, pine of varying different degrees. Right, so. If 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 we look at that as a as a metaphor for the past, for example, and people thought, right, um, this person only used pine, therefore the only wood available um in 2024 was pine, right? But that's not true because we've got beech trees here, we've got oak trees here, uh, we've got hazel, we've got hawthorn, we're planting other trees like willow, right? We've planted 1,300 trees, right? So it's not fair for archaeologists to look at what I'm doing now and we're also the same about the past people in the past built with different materials right it doesn't mean to say that other materials weren't around but then we look at the other evidence like the pollen grains to try and understand those other materials that may not necessarily have been used so the chance survival of for example something like this which is which we've which we've already established is is um, a spikelet of 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 spelt, for example. Um, you know, this is again, this is still very rare evidence, but it's still out there. Um, and one 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 thing one thing that we one thing that we need to um, understand um, is that um, we're not always um, available to even get any picture of the Bronze Age. We, you know, we might have complete eradication of Bronze Age evidence, or we might get loads of it. So uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna pick on somebody now. And I and I did this last night and it worked really well. It's sort of um you hear another voice. So I'm gonna pick on um I, I can't remember who I've got to I've got Pat, Richard, um uh, Peter, um Goff, um Anne. Right. Okay Peter, I'm gonna pick on you. Right. Right, Peter. Um, you're excavating an archaeological site and what you see in the ground is you've got four post holes and it looks organized. It looks like these post holes, which um, the spacing is about a, a meter apart. Right. Mm. Uh, square. Right. Um, what could that what could those four post holes tell us? And we've got no other archaeological evidence. Um, well, I don't think it could tell you much about what's going on well a meter square i don't know i mean what that could mean above ground but i mean what could be preserved in the post hole by the um putting the post in uh if anything of the post has survived as well that's good for uh dendro dating and stuff like that but i, I imagine like um layers oh, okay. uh from oh, okay. the section of the post hole i don't know Right. Okay. Okay. You, you did really well there. Right. So um, I got to tell you that um, we sampled the post holes, and and the post holes told told us that they actually used um, the fairly young um, lengths of oak. Right. Um, and and the post holes themselves were were about uh, the diameter of the post holes uh, was roughly. Um, was roughly under 15 centimeters in diameter so that mm -hmm. must mean that the building that was constructed there was actually not a very tall building it's a small mm -hmm. building so so the two things that archaeologists can determine from that right there's no other evidence there. the archaeologists can determine two things that they were building small structures you can't live in them there's no evidence of a hearth right so they were using them for storage so those are the two things. What would be very valuable? And there's we got a prehistoric date from the wood, um, a Bronze Age date. So obviously, so we got these buildings. So they're obviously for storage. What would have been valuable to our ancestors would have been storing grain above ground. And also, 
um, having the ability to keep um, animals off ground level, such as lambs that might get very uh, vulnerable to damp conditions. They they might actually keep um, fowl of some description. Now, we don't know when chickens were being uh, introduced, but uh, we know that ducks were around. It might be a duck house. Mm. So mm -hmm. by, by that evidence... We can we can jump in and say that the, they're specific stories, buildings for something. So that is evidence enough to tell us that there was surplus, right? Um, obviously, and when you when you're able to keep ducks and so on, there is a surplus of eggs, for example. So this is telling us of some surplus. So those those are value very valuable indicators of an agricultural landscape. Without finding any of this. Without finding any bones of any animals, without finding any of that, but this is helpful. Anyway, thank you for that, uh, Peter. Thank you. That's all right. So, yeah. another potential source of carbonized seed um, has been tested um, with remarkable results. What we do find um, looking at carbonized seeds is that uh, we we can we can see that in rubbish in in, in rubbish dumps, for example, uh, when people are cleaning out the fires, they might get a little bit of carbonized seeds in, in the rubbish dumps. Um, we also find that um, sometimes to, to, to get an idea what the landscape was like, we might actually find evidence of burnt fat. And what if, if the chaff of the burnt fat was in was barley or the or the or the um the chaff of of the straw happened to be emma or or spelt. Um, by by the evidence of the chaff, you know that the that the the grain the seed is being grown that the chaff is being grown for the seed, right? So we're inferring that the chaff indicates that they had straw roofs, but the chaff is indicating that the product the 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 byproduct is a chaff, but the product they're actually producing could be barley could could be oats could be could be einkorn could be could be any of these things so it's it's thinking about the the inferred evidence um and thinking about the chaff itself telling us about um how the landscape is and 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 the other thing as well is that um if, if you're if you're looking at an archaeological site uh, and you're getting chaff for example from um from from wild grasses right you might be able to presume that they may not have actually been growing many crops um, because if they're using wild grasses on their roofs, you would think that if if barley chaff were available, um, if 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 the similar was available like emma wheat, they would use it on their roofs rather than wild grasses. Right. So um, sometimes the evidence can can nicely point to other things um, because because, um, you know, when when they're not using certain things when if they if they had crops and they're not using these things then maybe there was absence of those crops so it's all about thinking about these stimulations these simulations of of the stimulated landscape um and what 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 we can what we can think of when we look at the carbonized seeds again when we think about the carbonized seeds uh, these carbonized seeds represent not even 0 0.1 0 0.001 percent of what they were growing so say for example um emma wheat um one if, if you're growing emma wheat one acre of emma wheat right um that produces 36 million seeds and maybe in the archaeology, you might find three or four seeds quite preserved, and that's all you've got of the of the of that one year's harvest from one single acre, right? So it, it's you know we 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 do have the absence of archaeology, and we've got archaeology that that is available to be studied, um, but it's sometimes very very useful. What what is all what is useful? That there's there's other evidence, inferred evidence, for example. So. So obviously, storage pits are, 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 are a dead cert. So what what our ancestors did at some sites, which were really dry, for example, like Hampshire, maybe places like uh, Dorset, uh, maybe some uh, places which which are fairly dry um, um, in 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 the in the Midlands, for example, maybe some upland areas of, of Wales and so on. Um, you, you might have storage pits, and what people did with storage pits is that they 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 would dig a huge hole in the ground 
usually well drained, right? And and they might line it line it with clay, right? They they would they would fill it up with grain and and it, they they would they would cap it off. They put a shelter over it so no dampness gets in there or no <coughs> no water gets in there. And then when they they scraped out the last of the grains from the bottom, usually discarding the last of the grains from the bottom because it it may. Uh, it may have actually gone mouldy or something. What they did, they would fire the pits, right? They would fire them, right? They would, they would, they would build a fire in these pits, right? And they, they and and within when they'd set fire to that, any grains that would be on the bottom would be burnt, and 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 charcoal, carbonized, right? And that itself would tell us uh, again of of what was available within the landscape. And the other thing as well is if we're finding storage silos, and 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 back to these four posters. When when we when we looked at the our site in West Wales, um, Lan Lanhaddon. If you can remember the Lanhaddon lecture, I think it was two or three weeks ago. Uh, we we mentioned that there were lots of four posters at, at these at these sort of settlements, right? Um, and there was loads of them. So if you've got lots of four posters structures um, at prehistoric sites, it means that there's lots of surplus, right? Meaning that they're that they're doing really really well really really well so the other thing as well is potters careless potters sometimes what you might have is is a potter um and you you've got a clay floor right and as as the best way to create to to create anything is sitting on the floor isn't it you know sort of if you if, if you're gonna um have a um a corn stone Right, and you're gonna quernstone is obviously evidence that they that they're that they're milling, uh, they're milling seeds, for example, all types of seeds. You know, um, quernstones is a giveaway. You, you're not gonna have a quernstone there than any other reason than to to sort of create a flower, right? So, um, so you might be on the floor one day and you're sort of rolling clay and you're sort of getting a, some clay together, and within that clay is picked up some seeds, right? So you're creating a pot by hand. Like the pot that we saw at the beginning of the lecture, creating it behind because that the one from Shetland that was Iron Age example, um, and and you're creating this pot, you are working the sides and you bring that side up and so on, um, but in that you've got some seeds. So when you put that in the in the kiln, um, um, average prehistoric um, pottery kilns probably between about 600 800 degrees C. Um, if it's at 800 degrees C, they're doing really well, um, and on the outside the carbonized seeds are actually baked. Right. And actually, some of the seeds might actually be in a pot as well. So the outline of the of the seed is carbonized and you'll be able to work out what they what what they are actually eating um, and what what seeds were actually available to them. So before we actually go on to this, this image, which is which is tool evidence. Um, bone evidence is really odd in archaeology, and, and I'll tell you why bone evidence is really odd in archaeology um, is simply because. When you when when you when you're field walking in archaeology, right? When you're going out wandering across the field with me, I, I, what I usually say, don't pick up any bones, right? And why do I do that? Because people have eaten bones throughout the ages, and there could be a sheep that's just dropped dead in the corner of the field. Um, you know, I, I've got people excavating a, a sheep that's dropped dead in the corner of a field, thinking it's an archaeological artifact, and it's a sheep that probably died thirty years previous. Right. Um, what you've got to do, you've got to excavate bones in context in the layers of archaeology, you know, and that's what you've got to do. Survival of bone evidence depends much also on soil. As as we know, you're not going to find bones in a peat bog. Right. Because because the, the acid eats away um, at the at the bones, the calcium, but the, the acid doesn't eat away at the flesh. So if, for example, um, a cow dies in a peat bog, um, its skin would survive, its flesh would survive, but the bones wouldn't. That's what I, but in in other situations, it, it's um it's alkaline conditions, alkaline soil. Um, and you know, it, it's it's sort of not really through alkaline, it's sort of in the middle, sort of coming towards acidic, perfect soil conditions. Bones will survive, but the flesh won't survive naturally. So what you need to do, you need to go to, to to looking at the settlement evidence and become paleozoologists. Um, and what 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 you then do is you you look at the bone evidence to 
to try to work out um, what animals were available to them in, in the past. For example, so we we'll go through a few little images a minute. Um, and there, that is called a mouflon. Um, that is very similar to our borrowed sheep that, that we've got. And uh, those that don't know, we're proud to say that we've got two two baby Borre lambs, a male and a female. Um, but anyway, back to this. This is very similar to our Borre's that we've got. Uh, this is a mouflon, which would have been one of the, um, it's known as a relic species. They still exist, but mo most most um, sheep are, are derived from this one, like the soy sheep from the island of Soye in Kilda and the island of Borre. Um, so, so what we've got is, is that, um, you, you can't really look at sheep and think that they are there only because humans have brought them onto the landscape because we had, we had, you know, naturally occurring sheep and uh, goats, you know, but what we then got to do is that when we start to see certain types of bones of sheep, i.e. we only find bones of sheep and they all seem to be dying around the um, the age of one, that was, that's a sign that they're being butchered by human beings without butchery marks, right? They're being selected, selectedly culled. Um, so the so depending on the bones you find in archaeology and and the, and the type of bones that seem may have been selected, the bone evidence gives us... Um, an understanding of the landscape um, that the farming was actually taking place um, within the the one the, the one thing that that we we know with with pigs and and um, and our bovines our our um, oryx our cows and and, and so on um, and and your horses and so on lots of those bones seem to survive um, you. Know, Bones associated with deer, um, you know, dogs and so on. Um, maybe they had a wild lynx that they tamed. I don't know. But any anyway, lots of these things survive um, when you've got the right conditions within the archaeology. Bones that don't survive on average are the bones associated with birds of any kind. Right. So the biggest problem is that we got in prehistory is 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 the chicken Um is the chicken problem. Some say that the Romans introduced the chickens as the Romans introduced everything, including peace and civilization and roads that never existed and things that go bump in the night. Um, it, it's unlikely that the Romans introduced chickens at all. But what the problem is, because the, the bones don't survive, right, it's difficult to understand when chickens for, were first introduced into a British context. Um, so, so the bone evidence is really, really important for understanding our agricultural landscape. And somebody, somebody, um, rightly or wrongly, um, one, one second. Um, um, so when when I did the four poster thing with Peter earlier on, we 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 were, I was mild, right? Um, because we didn't go, we didn't take it any further. And the reason why somebody last night said, OK, um, if you're keeping if you're keeping baby lambs or baby piglets or chickens in these four posters, then that indicates that they've got access to grains, right, to feed these animals. And I thought that that was a really good way of looking at this, right? Very good way. Um Mm -hmm. But I, I'm so often being I'm so often being told by Michelle that um, she she constantly says, "Well, did they did they actually did they actually always um, feed their animals grains in the past? Surely they must have fed them something else because these grains would have been more valuable um, for making bread and so on. Did 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 these animals eat?" The grains that the human beings are planting uh, within their landscapes, um, and then you start to think about this. Go up to the Brecon Beacons. There's loads of horses munching around the landscape. Go up to the Brecon Brecon Beacons. There's loads of sheep wandering around, right? Um, and you start to think that 
maybe they would not have needed to have fed their animals the valuable grains that they're planting within this landscape. So this is all really good stuff, in inferring the, the evidence. And we don't have any documentary evidence of the past, but what we do have is sketches, which, which we, we were going to do in a little while. But look at that. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna tell you what this is in in in, in a while actually, um, we might not have documents about the past right, but we we've we've got little carvings like this. I, I thought this was fascinating, um, and what's going on here? Think think about this right. So we don't have writing, but we 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 have um, th this th these these were actually found as rock carvings in a cave in northern Italy, right? So um, it's it's described as the rip. Ard and sod buster. So I'll explain what that means now. So the scene it represents is extremely important for our understanding of prehistoric agriculture. The Ard, which is, uh, uh, let's look at um, a full, let's look, um, there we go. Look at that. Love it, right? So um, that that's that's our, um, that's our uh, plowing, um, that, that that's what we're going to use to plow and on the end of that so you've got the ard it might be wood it might be stone so if you go back to the illustration right let's go back to the illustration there we go um so the scene scene represents to us um prehistoric agriculture so the ard itself is simply an angled spike pulled through the through the soil um one second i'm just going to finish my drink um in practice, it rips up the, the ground for about a couple of meters before it locks solidly into place and it's going to be brought back up again and it has to be lifted out and then repeated. So you can't get a, a complete straight line. You've got to keep it digs itself into the ground and you, you've got to you've got to bring it back up and you've got to you've got to plow in again. Right. So that's these are the old odds. And sometimes what we do see in archaeology um, is these odd marks um, in, in the um in the chalks or or, or the light um, subsoils below, so the, these these prehistoric layers actually survive. And um, oh, look at that! There it is being drawn there. Um, so so we're looking at that now. You're thinking, well, hang on a minute. You've got a chap in the middle, right? You have got the ard in front of him, and you got you got two. Um, I don't know. Are they, they they could be anything. They they could be sheep. They could they could be cows. Whatever, right? Um, now, what you've got is the two individuals behind and in front are carrying mattock hoes, right? Basically, um, if you think of a mattock um, um, and, you know, a mattock hoe, basically a mattock, uh, you, you've, you've got a long staff um, and then you've got a, a, a flat blade that comes out. That's a mattock hoe. And the one at the rear seems to be chopping at the ground Presumably, presumably breaking up the sods that mm. have been of the clods that have been created by the yard, right? Mm. And the other person holding a hoe leading the cattle, perhaps his role is releasing of the yard when it locks in place, right? That's what he might be doing, or he might be assisting the guy behind to draw um, the draft animals forward. So that's what's going on. Anyway, God, get, carry on. I, I, I jumped that a little bit because I, I wasn't, I wasn't supposed to be coming on to that yet. But uh, I, I am aware that we've got a lot to go through yet, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna speed up a little bit. Uh, we will have a little break because I, I've got a piece of, um, um, I, I, I got a piece of cake in front of me, which, I, which I want to have with a cup of tea, uh, in in about twenty minutes. So, um, so again, thinking about this, we, we've got an idea of some of the tools from this uh, this rock art. Um, and then what we then get is we look at, for example, that. So tools from all periods of prehistory, the survival and recognition of tools is critically important. Agricultural implements were fashioned from stone, bone, wood, bronze and iron. So obviously, by the time you get the Iron Age, you get all that. Right. And actually, one one thing I will say. And this is very important. Let's keep repeating this. When you get to the Bronze Age, they didn't stop losing. They didn't stop using um, stone or flint, right? When you get to the Iron Age, they didn't stop using stone, and they didn't stop using bronze, 
right? Um, so by the time you get to the Iron Age, they've got all these things for tools, right? So our primary problem is the identification of agricultural tools, assigning to them particular functions and attempting to discover how they may have worked. It is unlikely that we have a completely accurate picture of the past. So I, I don't I, I haven't got an image of it today, but um, can you remember the bronze sickle that we that we found um, within some of those cauldrons that, that that we found in the Bronze Age? You know, the little sort of hand sickles. Well, this is rather interesting. This is actually um, an antler, right? An antler hand sickle, which have been inserted in with blades of flint. And um, that that that's one before, and those are the blades that are mounted within a groove, which are to be found in this antler. Right, that looks more like a horn rather than an antler. But I'll 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 I'll, I'll beg, I'll, I'll beg away to agree with this from my notes. So that that's a, that's a basic um, a basic sickle. We've we've also been joined online by Black Patches Dog Carl. They um, have uh, have found chicken. Um, we're here in Britain, 300 years BC, and I really appreciate that. So we've got an answer. So we've got evidence Ooh. of chickens in Britain, 300 years BC. I really appreciate that that interruption there. Thank you very much. So, so what we've got then is is possibly that that may have been mounted. There may have been that that may have then been mounted or used like that, right? It may have been mounted on a, on a wooden staff, for example, or it may have just been used like that as a tool, right? So the cutting edge. Um, would be very useful for um, as a hand sickle for for some of your later crops like barley. But what we do find is that if you cut a spelt that we've seen earlier on um, with limited number of seeds and emma with limited number of seeds, you may as well actually pick them by hand to avoid you losing any seeds at all. Uh, but I, I can imagine that picking 36 million seeds um, on a Wednesday afternoon is, is quite a lot. So obviously let, let's let's zoom in on this and make it a little bit faster. So so what we do see in prehistory, they they they're getting very composite. They're they're they they're getting very sort of um using lots of materials. We really, really, really are. Um and obviously we've mentioned quern stones and we're talking about milling and we're thinking about all that telling us that milling's going on indicating grain. Um and the other thing as well is if we if we want to think about inferred evidence, um, if you think about, for example, um, hang on a minute. Let's let's have a quick go. Right. What are you going to do with those horns that 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 if you if you cut that right, that would make a perfect sickle mm -hmm. um, and lots of lots of boars have little tusks. Yeah. Right. Um, and you can you can use all these things. All these things are really, really valuable. You know, it's very, very valuable. Um, so so the one thing is let let's let's think of that again, right? Let's think of that again. So what we what we can tell within the archaeology, that, that tool tells us three things, right? It tells us one, they've only got access to flint, and they've got they've got a tradesman that's able to make flint tools like this. So he's got spare time. So that means when I say spare time, that's his job making flint tools. By making flint tools, he's away from the fields. Uh, but because he's away from the fields, it means that somebody's feeding him. So there's surplus. What is he being fed? Is he being fed meat or grain? So that's that's one clue. A bit of inferred evidence. Now, that could be an antler from a deer. It could be from um, one of our sheep, one of our one of our um, goats. So that means that they're keeping sheep and goats or they've got access to sheep and goats and therefore they've got access to milk from those sheep and goats. Right. Um, now, why are they why are they make that they're creating a sickle? So obviously they're growing crops. So all of this tells us with with these bits of evidence, even if you don't have these bloody seeds, you can tell that they were growing crops by by the evidence left behind. Um, it's the same thing. It's the same thing that um, a policeman does when they're investigating a murder, right? Um, if this is an obvious one. There's, there's, they found a bullet in someone, so therefore the person was shot, right? I know this sounds obvious, but but the person 
who shot the other person, killing them with a bullet, had access to a gun. Uh, where did they get the gun? And this is forensically how we do things in in modern um, in the modern world. And this is how archaeologists look at the past world to understand. And also, when you think about it, if they've got time, this is another thing. If they've got time to have agriculture, it's it's a fairly peaceful landscape because um, yeah, you, you you can't you can't have a crop if if everyone's being killed every five minutes, right? This idea that the prehistoric world was a warlike world is absolute poppycock, right? Is absolute bunkum, right? Because um, and when when we when we had that lecture about Lana Haddon, and I said you've got these these in the illustration, remember that there, there was an illustration and it, it showed heads on, on on poles along the gateway. And I'm thinking those heads might represent the villagers, um, you know, people that they wanted to remember as they entered the village. You know, um, Uncle Cecil's up there or Uncle Eric. And we're looking at his skull. Right. That type of perspective. So so I I, I think I feel I really do feel that when you see agriculture, it's a, sign, it's a sign of peace. It's a sign that people are getting on with their landscape. And when you see lots of tools and when you see lots of bits of evidence like this, agriculture is at the top of their game, you know. So I, I'm going to tell you a little story now. I'm going to tell you a little story. Um, this is, I, 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 um, I, had a, I had a flint, I had a flint expert come along to, um, do one of the archaeology Cymru conferences many many years ago um, and I didn't know how big this guy was in the Flint world but um, he was the type of guy who would turn up on time team but we we had him along to give a lecture and he was giving a lecture on Flint's it was great so afterwards this guy said he, he, he was in the audience he'd come up and he said oh um, I've got a box of um, cut stones that I found and I've got I've got four boxes in the back of the car so I looked at this guy and I said Oh, bloody hell, this is going to be good, isn't it? So we brought a whole tray of these things into the room, right? And um, and they all turned out to be bits of sandstone, right? And bits of limestone, right? They, none of them none of them had been worked, right? They they were just pointed bits of stone that he picked up um, up on the Brecon Beacons, right? And I turned to this, this Flint expert and he turned to me. And I said, I turned to this guy and said, some of them may have been shaped by human hands, right? And I'm glad I did that because when you look at an image like this, this is a group of stone hard tips. Um, maybe one or two of those items that he collected out of the thousand that he had in the car may have actually been stone hard tips that have been used in the prehistoric period. So what I said to the guy, I, I, I said to the guy, keep collecting these artifacts because, you know, in amongst your collection might be actually something significant, right? But this is proof of that because um, the, these were these were discovered in in these are these objects have been discovered on Orkney, um, and they've also been discovered on Shetland, right? And archaeologists didn't know what the bloody alleys were for. They thought, God, what 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 are these for? You know, what 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 is it all about? You know, um, and what it's all about, right, is this. So what you've got, um, you've got this being pulled through the, it's being pulled at the front, okay? Um, and it's 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 being just pulled through the ground by a human being, right? There's no animals. That there is one of those stones. Mm. So, so that there is a complete one. They look like big, big, long stone sausages. Um, and it's likely that the one end wasn't wasn't really it was naturally shaped. That's what that's what those other objects are, right? Um, and 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 by finding hundreds of these across the Orkney and Shetland landscape, these are clearly showing that this is the type of agriculture that they would have been involved in. Okay, you're not going to create a really deep furrow. We we know that agricultural activity in in prehistory, uh, the furrows weren't really deep, right? But as I, I I've got um, today, for example, I was 
I, I was digging out a, a garden that I, I created down here. And last year I come up with some mass so big boulders, you wouldn't believe them, in an in a little garden area, which is about two by four metres. Tiny little garden, which I planted trees around. It's my own little garden, right? And I planted potatoes in it. Well, I was digging it up today and I found more stones. I thought, mm. oh my God. But if you, if you keep ploughing a landscape, right, you get rid of those stones. And what we do see in archaeology is mounds of stones on the sides of fields uh, because um, ancient farmers have, have just piled up the stones on the side of the field. And eventually agriculture gets easier. But to start off with, it's really, really hard because it's going to be a very moraine sort of stony landscape. So that that's that's the technology that we're actually talking about. So. So so what 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 we've got is that um, the, these these types of these types of objects um are to till the soil assigned to till in the soil uh, and these have been reconstructed at sites like the butzer ancient farm project um and these are directly experimental and also um there's something else in the image right now it, archaeology is a very exciting area of 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 study right and, and when you think about those four poster buildings, now, what you, how do you make the walls of the four poster buildings? You don't have MDF and you don't have um, two ply and you don't have three ply and you don't have all those things. And you're thinking, well, what did they use? They use wattle panels. And what they did, they applied daub on the outside. Occasionally, what we find is 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 I call it brick waste. You you find um, daub waste, right? And it's been burnt, right? So these buildings may have been burnt, and and the daub has been heated up, creating ceramics which are lying around the field, right? But the size of these buildings would have inevitably been wattle hurdles like this. So three wattle hurdles. Um, you may have had one wattle hurdle hurdle that you that you tied with a bit of string on the bottom so it brought itself down like a little ramp um, you may have put a little bit of a thatch on the roof but the point is these hurdles are evidence of coppicing right evidence of coppicing um willow evidence of um, coppicing hazel um evidence of coppicing you could you can coppice anything really right um you know there's an argument did is sycamore an ancient prehistoric um tree that became extinct and and was reintroduced in the in the 14 1500s but that's another thing altogether um so in many part so again this is inferring the landscape um yes so much you can you know when we talked about the four poster building earlier on we're excavating in the field all we've got is 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 the radiocarbon dating evidence. We've got a four poster structure. They're storing something in the field, uh, but they've they're also harvesting and coppicing. Uh, they've also got a roof on it because there's no stones lying around. So they must have had a thatched roof or something like that. So all of this is really useful for for us archaeologists to understand what's going on in the past. In many parts of Britain, um, evidence of prehistoric farming survives in the landscape in the form of voila. Voila, voila, voila. This is this is associated with uh, in in um, Hampshire. There's a, there's a site called um, um, Butzer Butzer Hill. Also, the Butzer Project, which was a project established by Peter Reynolds, who's no longer with us. Guy with a massive, huge beard, uh, as nutty as a box of frogs, and he reconstructed um, a, a, um, a pre prehistoric buildings. Um, and I think he pre re reconstructed a Bronze Age one and uh, Iron Age ones and the Roman building down there, reconstructed the landscape. Um, and that's from Butzer and these hurdles and so on. But near Butzer is this landscape, beautiful landscape. Um, um, and one of the things one of the things that we, we do know about in archaeology um, is is that um, most commonly what we do find is prehistoric landscapes survive on hills and slopes. Like Dartmoor, um, like like um, the Brecon Beacons, um, like the Cumbrian landscape, like the Grampians, and so on. So, what what those landscapes have 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 survived because it's a prehistoric landscape that has survived um, because nobody has gone back there to plant crops again for whatever reasons. That's that's another lecture that we've already done. But what's happening within the landscape is is that 
I, what I'm going to do is draw over this. Don't worry, just ignore that there. I can't be bothered to come back off and on. So uh, what we've got, we've got a slope there, right? Now, when when you're when you've removed the trees, right? What happens is, hang on, when you move, hang on, let's draw that again. When you remove the trees, what's happened? There's something that we know of soil creep. This goes all the way to the bottom of the valley. And, and the soil builds up in the valley and chokes the valley up. So what our ancestors do when they're planting crops, they 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 might actually um, create little banks. But what might happen is something known as a lynchet, right? And what a lynchet is, is a natural, naturally creating bank. So what our ancestors might do, they, they might plant crops um, in the field. Um, and they might plant crops down here. That's a human one. And that is a natural one. The natural one are called lynchets and the human ones are called banks. Right. And what you do see across uh, the landscape is lots of these little low lying little bank type things. You know, if you go to the Brecon Beacons, you can clearly see this. And, and I'm sure uh, with with the research that Peter's doing, you can find lots of these on the landscape that he's looking at as well. Um, so. Soil creep um, retaining and all the rest of it. Um, soil erodes away, but but um, what happens is because of um, what happens grasses when the landscape is abandoned. Um, as long as you don't have much sheep grazing, um, the landscape is stabilised, right? Um, and sometimes what we might find is evidence of posts running along the latch natural lynchets that are formed, um, or that the hedge. Or a bank that's actually been formed, the field boundaries that have been formed. Inevitably, ancient fields which have survived in our, our landscape um, uh, uh, are in these hill-like landscapes. The, 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 the prehistoric landscapes that are in lowland areas have usually been destroyed and ploughed out because, um, you know, that's what's happened because later evidence, deep ploughs and deeper activity and all the stuff they add to the fields um, has a historical effect obliterating um, earlier farming evidence. And, and and this is another thing. This is going to sound really obvious, right? And if any of you think I'm talking down to you, I'm not. I'm, I'm just trying to explain this in, 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 in a good, sound way. Um, so what, what, what we do find um, is, is that when we see, when we find settlements, right, when we find settlements, settlements indicate that there is agriculture. We can't find any agricultural landscape, but the settlements in prehistory are indicative of agriculture. They are there. They're set within the landscape. They're staying there. They're staying put, right? Sedentary lifestyle, they're, 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 they're there for good, right? That means that they've got agriculture. End of. There's no argument just because you can't find evidence of any of the grains, evidence of any of the bones of the animals. Um, they're there and they lived within that landscape because <coughs> there's a settlement there. You know, I, I um, if, if we think about this. An army marches on its stomach, right? Our ancestors lived on food. So therefore they grew it. And guess what? They didn't they didn't have Tesco's and, and Lidl's and all these wonderful things that we've got today. Right. I tell you, I tell you what. Right. Um, we would be fine here in West Wales. You guys wouldn't because you're reliant upon Lidl's and Tesco's and all these shops. Right. We grow our own crops. We've got our own animals. And again, I'm not talking down to you. I'm trying to make a point. Uh, the point is that everybody in the past was like that. They, they had their own crops. They had their own animals. Right. Um, I couldn't live here unless we unless we we had the products that we're producing. Right. Um, and the people were like that in the past. Right. We will have it. We'll, we'll have a short break in a moment because I, I want this um, this piece of cake in front of me. It, it's it's growing on me. It's, it's looking really good. But um, yeah. well, hang on a minute. I'm finished. Yeah. Um, so but but the other the other thing, um, the other thing that's fascinating to understand previous agricultural landscapes is bog bodies within bog bodies what we find with lindo man we, we we know of his last meal because of his gut contents right we know about that we also know from the gut contents where there's worms found in the gut contents mm. some of those worms derive from animals right 
um, because he's eaten raw meat or he's eaten um, some fishes that have that have got um, uh, have got some kind of worms in them. They've made them into the human system, and then then they've 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 housed themselves in the human system. So therefore, the guy had been eating animal flesh, right? Um, or or, or maybe I haven't been washing his food, but it's very likely that um, the 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 plants the plants that were growing um, they they were associated with animal dung, and obviously uh, maybe um, he's eating meat, and which, which or she's eating meat. So obviously you find that in the gut. So obviously a bog body is a valuable evidence of of previous agricultural landscapes. However, he's buried or she's buried, right? Um, and also um, the other thing as well is. Um, paleo fecal analysis, uh, dissecting fecal analysis of the past, giving us a good indication of of what's going on. And also another piece of in, inferred um, evidence. And also we got uh, Mr. Wood, who's just joined us, just popped in. Um, and it's a uh, keep. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. The other thing as well is animal fecal matter. Right. OK. You're not really going to find sheep's droppings, but you might actually find droppings of birds of prey right and by looking at droppings of birds of prey you might be able to find out that there's a spike of certain rodents in the animals droppings right um, and that bird of prey may actually be feeding um, on a black rat uh, which may have liked to be in around human beings um or when you're looking at animal droppings from a bird of prey, um, you might actually find, or and you can actually find the same similar evidence with a badger or or, or a fox because they, they 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 eat various different bits and pieces. Um, by looking at the, the the fecal matter of animals, you can get a good idea um, of whether those animals are living around human beings or not by the very nature of the material that they're eating. So obviously if you come across droppings from um from from a badger and it's got quite a mix, um, you know, it's not dominated, then there's no humans around. If it's dominated by one thing, um, for example, you none of none of you might not know this, but badgers like eating chickens. So if you find a badger dropping, for example, from um three thousand years ago, and not the not um 2,300 years ago, what Black Patches Dog has actually told us, we've got the evidence in Britain, um, that that means a great deal um, that we're able to understand by other animals what our diet is. So what we're going to do, we're going to take a break, and, and I'm not really sure we're going to get through all this tonight, which might be a bit of a shame. I might speed up a little bit. Um, I, I might sort of, um, you know, make, make a little bit more um, of less rather than making... Um, you know, making it longer. Uh, but so so what we can see is the different evidence and the different forms and the different sites, different boundaries, different seeds and so on, really give us a good indication of the past farming landscape. But what we need to do, we've got a little bit more to go yet, right, before we can call it a day. So what we're going to do, we're going to look at trees and get an idea of the, the, the tree landscape. We're going to take a break for everybody. Uh, we're going to take a, um, I think, um, maybe what one might do is just a five minute break, actually, because enough time to have my cup of tea um, and my piece of cake and for everybody to get the kettle on um, and for Richard to drink the whiskey that he, I, I kindly bought him the other week. Um, right. Um, Anne, anything you want to say um, now? Well, it's certainly uh, interesting to see the different um, land marks, you know. Uh, and land the... use. Hmm? And land use. Land, well, land use, yeah. Uh, I mean, those were like artificial, uh, I forgot what you called them. Landscapes. Yeah, there's like, yeah. I mean, I, I know it's all artificial, but... Um, you know, where, whereas you might have thought it was a natural formation, it's obviously been made. Yes, man-made, yeah. Yeah. So obviously the biodiversity changes and, um, you know, it, uh, here's a fact for you. Um, um, I, I think I think the figure is something like 70% of all animals on the planet are, are, are grown for human consumption, which is quite shocking. Mm. I I actually think the figure's closer to eighty, but um um yeah, you know, I'm 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 going between the, the two. So uh anything else, Anne? 
No, not at the moment. No, it's, uh... and, and, and that's a really good point as well. If we're starting to see the dominance in archaeology of, say, cows and, and, and sheep, then obviously that's a sign that human beings are around rather than a mix of uh, flora and fauna. Right. <laughs> so anyway, Richard, go on, Rich. No, no, interesting subject. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll we'll have a break in a moment. Pat? Um, I was just amazed at all the different um, varied evidence, you know, I mean, all the different things they study and find out and research, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it's amazing. And, and at the beginning of the lecture, I said there's, there's, there's not a lot to go by, but there's a hell of a lot. So... <laughs> So yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, sorry. I was saying. Any, any anything else, Pat? No, that's it. Thank you. Okay. Quickly, Anne. No, I was just thinking of the wind. You know, the like when I was saying about nature, you can't control nature, but we must, we must depend. We must work in in symbiotic relationship with nature because, say, somebody what wants pollination, you know, wind pollination. Well. They they they've got to wait for the wind, or they've got to know when it's going to be windy. You know well, that that that, you, that, that, that that's, a, that's a nice point. Yeah, you that's know, a nice point. Use the wind because you know there's probably seasons when it's more windy, and they can expect it to seize itself and things like and that. And upon it, all, all all of those act aspects are really relevant. Yeah, you are right. You are right. Yeah. Okay, oh. Peter. Peter. Oh, no, I just want to echo uh, what Pat said. I think it's just amazing the things they can study, and particularly the pollen evidence, the you know the seed evidence, all that stuff for a rebuilding environment. I think is absolutely fascinating. Yeah. It, it is. It's major. It's major. Don't don't ignore anything. And uh, yeah. Goff, we're going to have a break in uh, for five minutes. Anything you want to say? No, nothing to say. Thank right, you. we're going to have a. We'll have a quick break for five minutes. Go and put your kettle on. We'll be back at uh, 8.53 or 8.54. Go on. See you in a minute.
I had a box of chocolates today. Oh yeah, well, what what difference is that going to make to Goff? You know what I mean? We, you know, me and Goff won't be able to have any of those biscuits. Oh. Why even mention it? Because I'm eating one now, and it's. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you just had a cake. Oh, it was a really nice cake as well. You know, we used to have, we used to have, we used to have this guy who used to make uh, cakes for the Atlanta Major class. Oh. It, it got so it it there were. It, there were there were so many. Basically, it turned into a cake making class. Um, yeah. We had a lady who did cakes. Yeah, but not like not like three or four cakes a week that uh, <laughs> uh, Goff had given the will to live after that. <laughs> they were nice cakes. They 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 were nice cakes, but the problem is, it was just every week. I know. Yeah, it's too much. No one to use old cakes. You get yeah. a taste for it, don't you? And, uh... yeah. yeah, no, the the thing is, it was okay for a treat. And I thought, well, that's okay, you know. And then, then somebody else baked one the following week, and I thought, and then he baked one. It was like a competition. And I thought, for God's sake. Anyway, right, let's let's crack on. Oh, actually, it's only I've a got... little, little box of chocolates, you know. About yeah, well, you could have at least you could have at least shared one with me and uh, Goff. Forget about Richard. You know, he, he don't like chocolates anyway. 
Right. So what 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 I did, I found this I found this article on on um, online. It was it was something that I did yesterday. And if I can get my thing up, there we go. And there. Well, yeah, um, I don't know if I mentioned it last week. It was an article about high tides expose stone graves at cliff collapse. Right now, I'm looking at that, and that clearly looks Bronze Age, right? It clearly looks like all the evidence that we've seen from the Bronze Age. But the archaeologist who found this up on the Northumberland coastline thinks it could be medieval or um, Viking. And I'm thinking, no, yeah, you know, I've been doing archaeology for quite a long time, and it just doesn't look like that at all. Um, so uh, for me, that is definitely Bronze Age. These, these being um, eroded along the coast, and this is like now, you know, the 18th of March, well, a few days ago. Uh, two stone line structures thought to be graves have been discovered after a, a section of cliffs collapsed in high tides. Police were called to Foxton Beach near Almouth in Northumberland. Oh, uh, the archaeologist said that these these are kiss graves, box light stone oh. coffins. Um, and basically, um, they, they, they found them. Um, you can see one there sticking out there. And I don't, to be honest with you, I really don't know... Um, you know, the, the the police being called, you know. Um, so I've walked my uh, I've walked my dog on this beach and I've never seen anything like it. Um obviously the police were there and uh it, it's it's um not far away from Bolna uh, um Bulmer Cliff. Um and nobody's had any talk in a grave, so so there they go in the background. And um so it's actually quite deep when you think about it, really. Or, um you know, it, the, the, all the sediments and stuff is actually quite deep. Um, kiss graves. Um, I don't know why. I don't why the hell do they need all those police? I don't know. They didn't need any police at all. Landscape rich in archaeology near the the site of Hoyk, which is a Mesolithic site. I just wanted to bring that to you. I didn't. I didn't look up. I I, I thought I just didn't have enough time to digest it about this blue stones thing. Um, but we we will we will do that for next week. Right. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go uh, back to the images and maybe we'll, we'll have that in the background a, a minute because we, we had that before the break anyway. The sequence of development, the development of agriculture during the prehistoric period is the key to understanding how the landscape evolved and it did evolve in many different ways in many different places across these, these aisles. And the earliest occupation of Britain, we do see that, um, that things seem to have gathered a steady pace. Now, there was a problem last night that we'd spotted from an earlier lecture because it, I don't know, it, 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 it brought up in, it brought up in a strange way. And what this was, it was as follows. I, I, I said, I said, look, um, you've got an evolving landscape. And I said, obviously, people are moving into the landscape um, and they're bringing things with them. Um but when they're moving into the landscape, this is this is how the discussion went. This is the end of the discussion. It's likely that they just moved over there rather than 10 miles away. And the reason why, if you're moving into a new landscape, you've got to plant crops. OK, you've got to take your animals with you. OK, it's in it's in an area that you don't know of. You may have to cut down trees. So so the likely movement of people in prehistory was just over there right and not 10 miles away because if you go 10 miles away you could end up in a situation where you've got nothing your whole people starve and that's it so it goes against some of the models that we've done before and, and when we think about um, immigration into this country when we look at the beaker lectures right one thing that none of my none, none one thing that none of the writing challenged one thing that we didn't challenge either. One thing that I didn't challenge was the idea of the Beaker people coming over, right? And then suddenly becoming established, feeding themselves, having food. And it that wouldn't have happened. If people are coming over from the continent, they would have been small numbers and they would have needed to have been supported by the local population. They wouldn't have been able to come in and wipe out the local population. population. They would have had to have been supported by the local population, right? Um, and in a weird way, not to sound political, this is how immigration in the UK works today. People come over from the continent, right? I've got to watch my words and we support them. We're going to leave it there. Um, 
And but but when we look at movements of people around the landscape per se, forget about the other model that we just mentioned per se, it's going to be likely over there rather than 10 miles away. And the reason why I'm saying that it makes things easier to understand how things are developing. It's a bit like the tree line, right? Um, before before humans started to become, become dominant in Britain, the tree line in Britain, you're thinking about, right, okay, um, you know, um, your your hazels, your your midland hawthorns become established, and then you get the bigger trees like your your aspens and, and, and your ashes, and then you get your much bigger, like your oaks and your elms, right? The, the tree line keeps moving forward and starts to... Um, uh, starts to colonize Britain, whether it's pollen blown, whether it's rhizomic, whether it's um, nuts and so on. So I'm thinking of that in, in regards to human beings, right? It makes more sense. And why it makes sense that if you look, for example, like I use this example from time to time, when we look at the Amazonian people and we look at the, the people of the terra preta, which means black earth, basically across the Amazon in areas, there's big, thick black layers, right? Of, 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 uh, but what you've got, you've got burnt material, natural landscape, burnt material, natural landscape, or human material, natural landscape, burnt material, and th th there's terra preta, right? What we know about the what we know about the 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 Amazon is that people would move from there to there, right? Not from there twenty miles down the road. There's no roads, but there to there, right? So they they would establish a Garden of Eden. Um, from a garden of Eden, they'd have they'd have the honeybees. They they would they would have a house. They 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 would have the animals. They would have the fish. They had small crops that they would grow. They they would have the mushrooms. They would have all, all the everything else, right? And and it got to the stage and they thought, right, after seven years, they would go right. What we're going to do? We're going to just move over there, right? They'll bring the things with them and move over there and and maybe reliant upon some of the food that's still grown at the old site for a while and so on. And then they become reestablished in another site. And this is the model that I'm really starting to think that, that, that people were really much into mm -hmm. in the past rather than the model of just up in sticks and going somewhere. We all know what it's like up in sticks and going somewhere. We've got to know where all the new shops are. We've got to know where the doctors are. We've got to find friends. We've got to join community groups. We, you know, um, it's not easy. Back then, it was near on impossible to move um, 50 miles down the road. They just wouldn't have done it. And, and because it's it's if you're reliant upon agriculture, you're reliant upon a system that, that gradually moves step by step, revolutionary steps, steps by steps, just 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 moving down the road rather than 10, 20 miles away. Mm -hmm. So what, what the other thing that what we do find is that the, the plants that these people are growing within these types of landscapes, Initially, you've got um, you've got einkorn, you've got then that sort of there's this sort of cross um, pollination and that sort of develops into um, the likes of Emma. And then then we're talking about spelt being developed. All these things might be deliberate or accidental. But this is about a, a landscape that, that that's slowly evolving rather than a landscape that that, that you're just moving somewhere else and all these factors about soil erosion climate change and everything that's all got to do with it the labor investment in clearing land and growing crops um is is huge right um and and when you 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 move your settlements just over there rather than uh, way way away because you're very much reliant upon re-establishing yourself um um, and this is the thing. Um, you don't reestablish yourself far away from supply lines. You know, I, I think I think a great deal militarily in, in in how how life is is to be developed. Say, for example, you think about Napoleon as a metaphor when he goes into Russia, his supply lines are so 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 long that he's unable to feed his his soldiers. So when you think about our an, an, ancient ancestors, if your supply lines are, are so long, you're unable to feed people, everybody dies, it's pointless moving anywhere in the first place. Right. So so all of this is the treadmill of agriculture is slow. There's a movement is slowly bit by bit. Zigasigar, as they say in, in Greece, is bit by bit. It's just slowly moving forward. And then and then and then as well. Uh, animal husbandry you, you, your animals develop you know you you get new strains of sheep and pig and goat and horse and all these other things new strains as 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 all these things start to give way to to new um new wheats and so on you so know, if we if we 
Hang, hang on, hang on a minute, Anne. Um, just, Anne, you're gonna have to say it quick. Well, we're learning about crop rotation as well, aren't we? Really, is you know, it's, it's, yes. it's uh, you know how they did it in the medieval times, but they must have learned it before then, you know. But but when you th when you think about crop crop rotation in medieval times, there's a problem with that, Anne, and I and I'm glad you've you've raised that uh, as 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 like a comparison. In 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 the med oh yeah we did uh, Anne you must have been watching last night's lecture we did precisely this last night. Um, basically, when you look at the medieval period, the medieval period you've got um, um, you don't have much variety. Um, but you've got you've say for example got fads. So most most villages, um, most most people by the 1300s decided to go over to cattle, right? So they'd have a cow living with them in the house, right? They would live in a byre. So so down below would be would be, would be the animals. They they would have a loft and they would live in 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 the loft, for example, right? Or or the the, the cattle would sleep over there with the sheep, right? Um, and and we would live over here, right? And and that causes disease and bacteria and and um, you know and and that's where anthrax comes from, cattle, right? Um, and you think, okay, when you get to when you get to um, thirteen fifteen um, and you get to the mini ice age, what what you get you get a population that's very much dependent on one or two crops, right? Um, and 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 it's very difficult to live within that system. The mm. prehistoric system was a was was a was a greater variety. Mm. Um, uh, it wasn't so much crop rotation; it was crop yeah. crop diversity. Yeah. Well, crop rotation. You are right, Anne, to mention that crop rotation in the medieval period was: we'll grow barley here this year, yeah. and then we'll grow barley on the other field the next year, mm. and we'll grow barley on the third field, and we'll go back to the first field, and we'll grow barley again. Right? Mm. These people did a lot more than that. Their 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 economy, their agricultural economy in pre in prehistoric times was much more wiser. This image itself, this is a this is what's called a secondary woodland. Um, and they created these for the Butzer project. And what a secondary woodland is, um, is is that the, the landscape was once cleared, right? And now trees are being regrown again, are being reestablished. Mm. So that's really, really interesting, right? Um but this is more than just a secondary woodland. This is a woodland that has had everything cleared. There's boulders gone. The boulders are gone. Boulder woods. Um, when you, when you um, for, for example, when you go to my planned areas, um, oh God, let me come up with an example. There's there's lots of them um, in Derbyshire, for example. You get some upland areas in Derbyshire where you get boulders strewn across the landscape, and you're thinking, hmm. They cut down the trees, but they didn't remove the boulders and they didn't come on to having full grown, ag grown agriculture. Because if they had, the boulders would have been in the way, right? Lots of them. Um, and they would have um, um, broken them up and put them to the side of the field, right? So when when you think about a woodland like this, it, it's, it's a very much developed landscape. It's a very much harnessed landscape. Man is in charge. Human beings are in charge of the landscape. Even Savanac, even Savanac Forest um, in Wiltshire, that's that was once um agricultural land but in the savanac forest you get trees that are over a thousand years old but one time that whole landscape had been cleared of trees or most of the trees right um so so when when, when we think about how the landscape is evolving right we then start to think about humans not only hard not only harnessing um, the crops that they plant, not only harnessing animals that are around them and the animals that, that are very much detectable in all the evidence that we're saying. And the other thing as well is another thing that we need to think about, which 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 I know we've already done. If you start look, to look at the archaeological layers and all you find in the archaeological layers is the bones of animals that, that you know, sheep and pigs. But you don't find the bones of foxes and you don't find the bones of badgers and you don't find the bones of hedgehogs and all these other things. It might indicate that those entire populations have been completely wiped out. Because um, simple, simple. Um, why would you why would you leave a, a fat fox um, and not eat it? You would you would eat the meat from a fat fox or you might eat the uh, book, um, the meat from, for example, a rabbit. Um, if you don't find any of those evidences on an archaeological site, it means that human beings have been within that landscape for quite some time. They, they, there's been a, um, a wipeout of, hu of, of flora and fauna, may, 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 mainly fauna. Uh, no, flora, mainly flora, may, mainly the animals. And um, 
and it's it's just all these things help us understand how developed human beings are within the landscape. Um, I got a nice sizzling um, sound in the background. Um, so, what well, what we've got? Is, so this this is a woodland uh, that's been. This is a woodland that's been. Um, um, they, they've got coppicing going on there, and what they're doing, they're dividing the woodland to stop rabbits and deers moving around as well. Um, and again, that's using woodlands and landscapes for different things. Even though these things look natural, they're not. They're, they're human expansionist ideas to tame the, the natural landscape that was once around them. If you want to ask me the question of where are, where which parts of Britain have 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 um which parts of britain are completely untamed where we've got primeval landscapes well the brecon beacons is not a primeval landscape that's totally okay. been um you know that that's not primeval right i i think i've said this before i think the brecon beacons is ugly snowdonia is ugly there's no trees there's no life they should plant trees on it but the point i'm trying to make is it it's not a primeval landscape it it once had trees it once had lots of other things going on we do have some primeval landscapes there's 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 a, a primeval woodland in cornwall uh, there's there, I know of a primeval uh, woodland which is on the island of Hoy, which is Orkney. Uh, there's one or two in Britain, but primeval landscapes are far and few between. Um, what what we what we do see uh, also is that um, not only um, not only do we see human evolution in in the forms of um, what they're planting, right? Um, the climate has an effect on what they're planting, so. Um, is it is it the right thing to plant spelt or emma, which is in the middle, or einkorn? Right um, now, if you if you um, if you think that um, these things are dictated by human beings just wanting more crops and so on, lots of things could change because of the climate. For example, what we do see with the likes of Dartmoor is that the landscape of Dartmoor was dramatically changed by climatic changes um, and vast abandonment of those landscapes. Um, you know, it gets damp, it gets wet. You can't grow these things anymore. Do you, do you grow more hardier, hardier things as as barley's um, start to sort of come onto the the game or or various other oats and so on? So when when we think about the bronze, when when we think about um, how technology is evolving as well, people are developing different technologies in the way of tools, um, not because they want a better tools, because certain tools don't work in certain weathers and certain conditions. For example, you're not going to use um, a stone plowshare um, on very very rocky, um, solid ground, right? So therefore. You you might use a, a stone plowshare in Wiltshire, but there's lots of flint there, but it might be softer soil. You might use a um, a stone plowshare in Lincolnshire more of, but you're not going to use a stone plowshare in West Wales, right? You're going to think, well, I need new technology. I, I need to have this bronze technology. I need to have something else. So the sequence of the sequence of uh, farming is really um, was not based only upon cereal cultivation. Um, it was reliant upon lots of other factors. The evidence suggests that farming was essentially um, a, a mixture of everything from the beginning, which which is which is what we've been saying. It's a mixture of everything. Um, unlike the medieval medieval landscape that that, that Anne jumped in, and we we had that little discussion. Very different. Um, so the farming pattern um, is very different in different parts of of Britain, and obviously domestic livestock, sheep, goats cattle and pigs um you know what what we one thing that we think of and, and one thing that i'm finding out myself um is that it's oh yeah what we'll have we'll have a few sheep we'll have a few goats right well sheep and goats are a disaster story and why anything you're trying to grow the sheep and the goats will go at them you have pigs 
they will root through the woodlands and find things like truffles and things that you wouldn't have eaten before. Different animals have different ways of interacting and changing the landscape and altering the landscape by human in, human introduction. Um, for example, we, we we mentioned as well that when when you think about the 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 humble dog, a domesticated dog. A domesticated dog is a disaster story for for birds nesting on riverbanks. Dogs will go in there and scare away the birds, maybe attack the little singlets in in the nests and and so on. Um, so um, undoubtedly, all these different parameters are factors that that can ease us to understand the landscape and the burden that human beings um, are offering onto the landscape. Um, and you know, you know, and also, also, we've got to think about other factors of agriculture. If you're introducing sheep and goats and cattle and pigs, particularly the sheep and the cattle, they need to be fed fodder in the winter months, like hay, grasses. They need they need bedding, right? All of these things need to be grown, and therefore, this is very interesting, right? Um, if you if you don't have the fodder for these animals, right, you're only going to be reliant um, upon the crops. However, it's a catch-22. If you're unable to grow the fodder, you're not growing the crops to feed yourself in the first place. Therefore, you're not really going to have an active community, active um, um, sort of settlement, and you're not going to really last long. So, Lots of these things would change over a long period of time. You know, the the um, you know, for for example, what what we what we do see, we we see the evil uh, our evolutions of uh, the mouflon um, into sort of modern breeds like the Shetland. You know, we we've we've got Shetland sheep, right? They're the they're the most tamest, lovable sheep ever, right? Um, and they they earn their keep because we sell their dung, as you know. But um, they they have evolved from these animals. Our Shetland sheep do not have horns, but our Borrares do have horns. Um, and we what we do see is is that lots of animals have evolved. The the goat, for example, we we used to have something called the um, old English um, goat. They're still around, but they've evolved from more um, more feral goats and cattle, for example, developed from auroch. Domestic pigs developed from those pig piggies that would wander woodlands that were frightening little things that would make big squeals as they charged towards you at their tusks. They need to be tamed. So again, all of this, all of this needs to be taken into factors when we when we talk about farming um, and the landscapes that we're actually talking about. So what I might do, it's it's 919, right? Um, and I might actually um I might actually um just just sort of um do do a little bit more and then then we'll we'll call it a day, I think. We'll we'll call it a day. So so as we've now developed finally into the Bronze Age, we we've got um we're starting to think about um, you know. It might be that by the Bronze Age, people are realizing that you do need to have woodland. You do need to have pastoral. You do need to have arable. You do need to think about management of your landscape. Now, this is this is very important. I've mentioned this thing, right? That in the Bronze Age, let's do the gate dates again in the vol. Um, um the 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 record of volcanic eruptions right um we we can we can say for example 1628 bc there was the eruption of thera we're, we're talking about um one 1157 i think it is when we've got other eruptions from iceland and so on um, and we're, we're thinking right they, they've got massive alterations on the landscape people in upland areas abandon upland areas because they can't grow crops animals can't be fed in the winter months they start dying uh, there's there's a lot more rain um, um good soil has been washed off the landscape and so on and so on so on right okay but our ancestors knew that most of the time when we talk like that we don't presume that our ancestors knew that so as they knew that they would have started to realize that we have got to do something about managing our landscape right now I'm going to make a statement here, which I've never thought about and never made before. Right. Are we the only people in the history of the planet 
who've started talking about um, a global uh, warming or environmental change or um, are we the only people on this planet who've ever thought about that? It's almost as if we invented it. We 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 caused it. We we did all of this. We invented it, and actually, I don't think we did, no. because when 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 we these people had the same problems as we've got today. When 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 we think about it, let, let's just get on a soapbox a minute. When we think about the lost land of Doggerland, right? The people who were living on the dogger land didn't cause that it was it was water rising it was it was the ice sheet still melting um 8000 years ago 8500 years ago or whatever um the, the 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 water levels um the water levels are rising and dogger land is lost forever 8000 years ago it's gone it's over it's finished it's no more and these and, and there were mass tsunamis and floods and our ancestors knew this they knew that the the landscape around them was delicate. These people didn't go off killing off all these mufflons and all the wild pigs and 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 uh, all the aurochs and all the rest of it. We 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 think our ancestors were incredibly stupid, right? Um, just like the American government was in the um um. 1860s and 1870s by wiping out tens of millions of buffaloes that the Native Americans relied upon. The American government was stupid and they did it deliberately to isolate the Native Americans. But our ancestors weren't like that in the past. If they weren't able to work with nature, with woodlands and pastoral and arable landscapes, their time on the planet would be numbered, right? They knew it. So let's not let's not treat them as as prehistoric people who didn't understand things that we understand. They understand them as much as we do today. Arable farming, as we know, created fields, um, manure, seed planting, crop management, and harvesting. I tell you what, right? We haven't even covered this. They 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 needed to stockpile their manure. They needed to have surplus um, to plant the seed. They they needed to understand the management and the harvesting of the crops. And the provision of the manure is quite set. You needed animals to have manure in the first place. That goes without saying, or does it go without saying? So, so even though we're not really understanding how they thought, nonetheless, it's revolutionary to think that they 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 were able to contain their world and to be able to interact with the world and think about um what we've already looked at with this wonderful illustration what we're going to show you is is an evolution and we're going to show you an evolution if we go all the way back now we we'll go from this to an ard that was excavated in denmark right from a peat bog so let's go to it and there it is look at that beast right that ard was recovered from a, a peat bog in Denmark, right? So we're not only thinking about humans being found, we're finding evidence, right? Um, and this is known as the um, Donner Rupland Ard. This reconstruction is based exactly upon the evidence provided by the original ard recovered from a peat bog in Denmark. It has been used um, in extensive ploughing experiments and has proved to be extremely efficient. And you know what? You can just basically drag that across a field. It works, mm. right? You, you you don't you don't need to think of this, right? If if you've got soft enough ground, right, you can use this technology. These people use the technology, right? They 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 they. It was revolutionary to them. And again, think about that. Think about, um, think think about um, just sort of being able to drag that across the land by hand. But if you add cattle to draw this across the land if and, and instead of just using humans which would put more pressure and you'd have a deeper furrow this would be the effect yeah. this is drawn by yoked pair of dexter cattle right which which would be um which, which would be an up from um, smaller types of um oryx now there was an experiment of 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 development of of um, um an oryx bee breed um by two german scientists uh, within the third reich 
Um, and it was basically to develop a very strong, powerful, large animal that was based on earlier oryx. But these do the job anyway. You know, they really, really do. Um, and if if we think about um, this is this is an Im image. This is called uh, the heave of the ard. The soil is lifted by the ard and carried to swirl as it passes the foot of the main beam. Right. So what's going on? Um, this is all swirling up and it's sort of you you know what it means. It swirls on the left, it swirls on the right, and it goes through the soil, right? Um, and you you can you can plant in that. And this this is the technology that these people were evolving. <coughs> so what we're gonna do, we, we're gonna we're gonna go to um uh, we, we're gonna go to another image. And then we've got we've got one other Im image and we'll call it a day. And that, that'll be a nice end. I think uh, I, th I think this is nicely drawing to an end, actually. So it's really good. Um, so this this is this is um, this is actually from from Denmark. This is this is known as the. Um... Oh, so hang on a minute. To, it, I've repeated myself. Right, good. Uh, this is known as the uh, Little Spee rock carving in Denmark. There you go. The scene shows the drawing of seed drills with a specific type of ard. So basically, um, that's the ard there, right? And it's being drawn by two cows, right? So there we go. Um, and it's it's um, it's saying that the, the seed drill um, and a, a seed drill is is basically to um, to to make a further furrow um that can then the seed can be placed into it and that guy there the guy at the back he is the plowman he is carrying a bag of we think seed in his right hand his left hand guides the plow and holds a, a leafy um, buff above him and the purpose of this may well be a combination of fly swat and goad uh, the cattle appear to be yoked across the horns mm. now that's interesting they're yoked across their horns they're basically you know that's interesting <clears throat> the ritualistic nature of the carving <laughs> is demonstrated by the phallus on the cattle and the plowman well that that's uh, uh that's something else but when we're when we're thinking about this, this this the main the main point about all of this is he he's looked like he's got a bag of seed, um, and you you've got an you've got an extra, um, it's called a seed drill, um, and these, and, and that is a seed drill actually is usually, I think in this interpretation a seed drill is like um a little container with with a little hole and and then you. Uh, place it into the ground but I, I think in in this case when they're talking about a seed drill they might actually be talking about um making um uh, the 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 groove in the furrow a little bit deeper it re it's really op open for um interpretation on that but obviously the man with the two animals um and the um and, and he, if he, hopefully he's got a bag of seed and that's what's going on. You've got various, the two lines there, the two parallel lines that there probably indicate a furrow that's already been planted. <laughs> and finally, what we've got, we've, we've got a few other images, but we'll, we'll, we'll um, probably maybe come back to this again. Um, this is a reconstruction of the, um, a seed furrow ard, very much to what I described earlier on, making, making um, a furrow that you could put the seeds in. Um, as I've just described uh, when we're talking about um, when we talked about a seed drill. Um, and this this one, an example of this was found in a Danish bog. Um, and a few of these have been found. And the same type of art figures in the rock carving from Litsby. We do believe that that's what that is. This reconstruction has been used in extensive trials at the Butzer Ancient Farm. It produces an ideal seed drill. Um, in a prepared uh, till, so in other words, it it's it makes it a little bit deeper, a little bit of a groove. The seeds go in there, you overfill, uh, you backfill, and there you have got your crop being grown. And on that note, we're going to call it a day, um, and let's just uh, see. We're going to stop that, and let's see if there's any um, questions. And Pat will be relieved because it's only half past nine. <laughs> Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> 
on that note, Pat gets to speak first. Okay. Um, I wonder how you spell that word, ard. Ard? A-R-D. Just like it sounds, huh? I've never heard it before. Ard. <laughs> and, and, and a till is T-I-L-T-H. T-I-L. Till. Hmm. It sounds like tilf. Yeah. Till. Right. To till, till the like soil. Till Not T-I-L-L. Or whatever is till. Oh. Right, anything else, Pat? Oh, that's it. Thank you. Very interesting. Thank you. Um, what about you, Richie? Um, yeah, really interesting. I see the you seem to have got different sort of wheats and things like that. So what yes. are, what about things like parsnips and things like that? Are they around at that time? Um, well, um, obviously, obviously, we're not going to go into tomatoes and potatoes. Yeah, they I didn't arrive until really, the fifteen hundreds. But, but really basically, yeah, they're, they're, yeah. We, we, this is a thing. We this is this may have been this may have been discussed if we'd have gone a bit further into this. But um, I, I think I, I think um, you know, such as beans and um, you know, such as your your cabbages or anything like that. I, I'm sure that they would have eaten these things. Um, but obviously, the focus of the archaeology is very much to look at crops um, rather than you know the greens uh, that you're you're describing there. But they would have been around. I'm sure that they would have eaten them. Um, and um, it's obviously finding the evidence. And and lots of these things, you would find pollen grains from from lots of these things anyway. So it's obviously looking at the evidence to see to the, see these things being available for our ancestors to eat <clears throat> okay anything no, else yeah. richard no no that's it sorry to be vague on answering that question but but the yeah. the archaeology is vague that's why but I, i'm sure they would have you know yeah, i like to tend to hear more of obviously seeds you know um sort of corn and barley. yes, yes. Uh, there, there would have been tubers they would have been eating tubers um, humans have eaten tubers throughout history so, oh. <laughs> so they would have been tubers. Okay, Goff, anything from you? No, it was a very interesting, uh, but bit of a change. So it was great. Thank you. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, right, we'll we'll do we'll do Anne, and then we'll do Peter, and we'll call it a day. Oh, why is my McPhee thing come up? <laughs> I don't know, Anne. But any questions? <laughs> Locking my screen. I can't remember. Anne, shut up. I can't remember. Um, no, I was thinking, you know, the grain. I was thinking one of the reasons why, you know, the Roman Emma grain yeah. was substituted by, you know, more modern stuff is because of the gluten. The gluten in it is much better for making bread. It's and and they, they would have known that. They would have understood no. that. Well, not yeah. The the, the more modern, uh, there's got more gluten in it, you know, to make make bread easier. Well, um, obviously, there would have been cross um, cross pollination, and there would have been more strains being developed. And and when you think about it, chaff, uh, modern modern chaff is is actually lower than old chaff because we don't really use it anymore. Um, but um, they would have had longer, naturally longer chaff anyway. So it's just. Yeah. yeah, and you know the the sun and the moon and things like that were very important to them, weren't they? And and uh, that, that would have had an impact. Nature, you know, to helping them. And uh, no, I I think it's a really it's a, it is a really interesting uh, you know area that you know the start of farming. Yes. Yes, um, I want to do that today as we be, before we get to flag fen next week. Okay, then Anne. Okay, if there's nothing else from you, Anne, we, we'll go on to Peter. Peter, anything from you? No, no questions. I, I liked your point about seeing how people um, responded to different environments and different landscapes and how they go about farming in different areas by, you know, uh, different livestock or different different approaches to technology as well. I thought that was cool. Yeah, and, like and and obviously technology in different places, and and the one thing is there's no model for across the whole of Great Britain, and that's the point. And we've been yeah. saying about all the archaeology, and there's different ways of doing agriculture in different places. You know, mm -hmm. 
So you, you're not going to get two sheep farmers in Britain that today that that do the same thing with their sheep. You know, yeah. it, it's very different because it's different conditions. Absolutely. Um, yeah. yeah for, for example, we, um, for the past six months, this has been a bog. It's been muddy. It's been, yeah. There's been mud everywhere for the past six months, right? Uh, but other years, um, it's not been like that. But it's just it, it's and obviously things change. And this is this is the environment that our ancestors lived in. Constant yeah. change of evolution, and nothing's ever the same in one place. Nothing's ever the same in one place for too long. So, yeah. mm. so um, okay, okay. Anyway, thanks for that, Peter. If anyone else wants to say anything else before we finish. No. OK. Right. We're going to call it a day. So look forward to seeing you next week. We're doing Flag Fen and Must Fam in the near future. And we'll find out about the new facts to do with Stonehenge. They will be revealed for next week. Hopefully <laughs> they're as good as you think, Pat. But OK. Then. Anyway, <laughs> thanks for that. So we'll call it a day. Anyway, thank you for that, Goff, Peter. And See you Pat. later. Bye. 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 Take care, folks. Bye. 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 So long. A river duche. Happy Easter. <laughs> Ciao, Happy Bella. Easter. Happy Easter. Happy and a partridge in a pear tree. <laughs> and Goff's going to go and see Ghostbusters. Looking forward to it. Oh, my. We could go with you. We go to the Odeon. <laughs> Oh, go, 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 Goff's going at three in the morning, so he won't be up. <laughs> I've got to go with my probation officer. What? <laughs> He's got to go with his probation officer. Oh, but anyway... Yeah. Yes, okay. <laughs> okay, and I'll see you soon. Um, anyway, don't forget to like and subscribe. Any mm -hmm. would like to make a donation tonight, um, please do so and we'll we'll put the um we'll put the donation thing up on the screen. Um and we it, it's uh anyone wanna buy me a cup of tea? They they coffee, coffee, buy me a coffee. Um you can you can certainly do that. Um and uh I'll put that in and uh we'll put the donation thing. Or also oh hang on a minute, I've got to put another thing in the box. Hang on a minute. Um right, okay. So if you, anyone wants to make a donation can do, right? And uh, and also though anyone who wants a book for my live show, um I've got the link for that. So if you want to hang on a minute, um I will I will I will put that on you now. Hang on a minute. I'm just trying to trying to get this sorted out. Hang on. There's the link for any donations, and I'll put the PayPal thing down there as well. Um, but what we're gonna do, I'm gonna put in in the link um for the live show. So I need to start sharing that out. So we're gonna put the PayPal thing there. Anyone, don't forget to like and subscribe. Um, I just I'll just get the link now for the the new live show. Uh, this is for next year, but if you want to start getting your tickets now, because they're they're going to start to go. So um, hang on a minute. Hopefully, I can get this on. Oh, there we go. I won't be long, folks. Bear with me. Just getting this off the laptop. And technology as it is. I'll be having something shortly to eat soon as well. So, I have that. Right. Right, okay. Right, where where's this link? <clears throat> hmm. I'm just trying to find the link a minute, folks. Hang on. All right, okay. Hang on a minute, folks. Hang on, it doesn't seem to have updated. Right, okay, sent. Okay, uh, right, hang on a minute, folks. Hang on a minute. I'm just going to see if I can get this now. Right, th this is, this. these are for the live tickets. And I copy that. And 
and anyone who wants to uh, my live show can that, that that's to buy tickets for my live show so if you're interested uh, that's for the Astrid Gun Life show anyway thanks for um, liking and subscribing I'm going to call it a day now and thanks for your patience one two three over and one da, 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 da. anyway take care guys no no